We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, 10 o'clock service. Great to see you all here this morning. A couple, uh, I want to add on to a couple of those announcements real fast. Our Vision Sunday is really, sincerely, something you don't want to miss. There's so many amazing God-sized things happening around here, some things that we're going to tell you about that haven't happened yet. And just even looking at, uh, let me give you an example of, of the way God's moving in this church. You know, last year, in the entirety of 2023, we baptized 107 people, which is pretty amazing, right? That's, yes, that's amazing. At the end of the day today, and here we are just in, uh, you know, still some months ahead of us, we have already, we'll have baptized 98 people by the end of the day today, which is incredible what God is doing in this new year and how we're uh, continuing to impact the kingdom of God. Also, if you're one of the men in this room, I want to make sure you know about our men's weekend that we have coming up. We're actually dropping the price from where it was, it was around uh, like uh, just under $100. We're dropping that price down to 75 If you've already registered for it, we're, you, you got a refund this morning, um, so you'll see that difference in there. But that's going to be an incredible time. You get to sleep in your own bed because we're not going anywhere. We just kind of uh, are circling back here at the church for that re weekend retreat. All right. Everybody, uh, grab your copy of God's Word, and let's go to Colossians chapter 3 together. That's where we're at as we're going through the book of Colossians. Last week, we, we summarized really chapters 1 and 2, and the big summary was this, that Jesus is sufficient and Jesus is supreme, right? Jesus is all that you need. You don't need to add anything to the equation in order to make salvation work. We find salvation in Christ alone. Jesus is all that you need. And that's what Paul was trying to communicate to this small church in Colossae. Uh, don't let anybody trick you into adding anything to this equation. Now, what's interesting is that now that we have this truth that Jesus is supreme and Jesus is sufficient, it seems like Paul is about to add a plus something to it. And we just were told by Paul not to do that. If you look at the very first verse, in Colossians 3, just the very first part, it says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, in other words, now that we, uh, now that we have that, you know, Jesus is all that you need, now let's, let's add something to it. And that seems to go against what Paul's talking about, right? We're not supposed to add anything to Jesus. Jesus is all you need. So why does Paul seem to now want to, to, to change the, his, his tone a little bit? And here's what's going on here. He's simply saying that now that you know that Jesus is all you need, that Jesus is sufficient, Jesus is supreme, now it ought to change the way you live your life. There's going to be some changes that come about. And since then, you have been you know, raised to new life with Christ. Since you recognize that Jesus is supreme and sufficient, what's going to happen? What are the next steps that we ought to take in recognizing that Jesus is enough? And so Colossians 3 is kind of a transition where we now get to step into the changes that are going to come to our lives because Jesus is sufficient and because he's supreme. Does that make sense? All right. So here's the very first thing that we're going to notice, a change. The next step is, is this. Number one in your notes, write this down, change the way you think. Simply put, if you believe that Jesus is all that you need, that he is supreme and sufficient, your next step, your very first next step, is to start changing the way you think about things, changing the patterns uh, that go through your head, change the way that you process through different thoughts. We need to change the way we think. Here's how Paul says it in verse 1 through 4. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, 
who is your life is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So in these first four verses, there's a few spots I want to highlight. I want to explain a little deeper so we can understand what Paul's saying here. That one of the first phrases you'll see in this is this concept of, you see in verse 1 where it says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Do you see that up there on the screen? Set your sights on the realities of heaven. This, this phrase, set your sights, actually comes from one Greek word. Uh, it's zetio. And zetio actually translates into the English word to seek, to, to actively look for. You probably are familiar with one of our, our favorite games growing up, right? As kids, we love games that involve finding something that's hiding, whether that's going out into the yard and searching for hidden eggs, or it's your friend who's hiding behind a tree and your other friend who's hiding behind the barn and you're trying to figure out, you're like, hide and seek. We love actively going out and finding. And that's ultimately what this verse is saying. Since you believe that Christ is sufficient, and since you believe he's supreme, you now need to change the way you think. And how do we do that? Well, we actively seek. We go out and look for the realities of heaven. It's an active, not passive, activity that we take. When I was in high school, we would play this game called Rambo. And the way you played Rambo, we, you had to get together probably like 15 friends and you picked one person who was going to be Rambo. And you found a, a, an ending spot, which was usually our high school parking lot. And you pick another spot, the starting spot, which is about a mile away. So you find a mile away spot from the high school. And everybody gathers at that location. And the person who's Rambo gets a three-minute head start. Well, nobody's paying attention or looking. They get to run in any direction, get as far as they can. They're probably going to the run as fast as they can to get as far as they can in that three minutes. And then they're going to hide. Because after the three minutes are up, everybody else goes on a seeking mission. We intentionally uh, park our cars at major intersections knowing that this person at some point has to cross a, a McHenry Road. And then when they do, we're going to be watching both directions and, watch, and then we're going to run out. And so they were trying to get from point A to point B without getting caught. We called it Rambo. It was a seeking game. It was this active, you had a strategy, you worked together with a team, you were trying to, to find someone who was trying to not be found. And in this case, the realities of heaven are all around us, and we're supposed to go out and just actively seek them, look for them, find them. You know, I also though appreciate the NLT's translation of this word ZTO because it says to set your sights on. If you are a hunter or you've been in the military, or you just enjoy shooting guns, you understand this from a perspective of when you set your sights on something, you look through that, you know, the, your scope, and you understand that there's some certain things you got to do. If you're trying to hit a certain target, you're going to set your sight, you're going to adjust it, and you might go two clicks up and one click to the left, and, and, and probably in that process, you have somebody helping you too, right? You take a shot maybe, and they're telling you, all right, you got to go up, you got to go this far, you got you to make some adjustments to set your sight so that you can hit the target, right? Essentially, when you change the way you think, part of this process is to take your scope, focus on what's important so that everything else becomes unimportant. Everything else, the only thing that matters when your sight is set on one thing is anything that gets in the way. If something gets in the way of your target, well, that thing becomes a problem because we're trying to set our sight on the thing that we're trying to hit. And at the end of the day, we change the way we think by setting our sights, by actively seeking and finding these realities of heaven. It's an interesting phraseology, but there's another one in verse 3 I want to highlight. In verse 3, you see the words, for you died to this life. You see those up there? You died to this life. What does that mean? Essentially what it means is that for those of you who are followers of Christ, you've put your faith in Jesus, you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, you've put to death your old flesh, and you've taken on new flesh. You've taken off your old flesh, it's sitting there on the ground, and you've put on a new life in Christ. You know, for a lot of us, what we do for some reason is we, we take off our new flesh 
and we slip back into our old flesh, our dead flesh, and we put it back on. What do you call someone who's walking around in dead flesh? A zombie, right? We walk around like spiritual zombies. When you are a brand new believer in Christ or a believer in Christ and you go back to your old dead flesh and you put that stuff on and walk around with it, you're essentially walking around like a zombie. You're walking around in the flesh that's, that's not part of who you are anymore. That's dead. I don't know why we do it. We all do it. But one of the ways we're going to, to move past it is to change the way we think and recognize that's old, that's dead. I don't want to walk around in that. I want to recognize that I've already started eternity. Here in this broken world, eternity, believer, starts right here where you're at. It says very clearly, right, that you died to this life. Our eternity has already begun just without our perfected body yet. Now, here's my favorite passage in, in this, these four verses I want to highlight. Notice in verse 4, it says, And when Christ, who is your life, will you say those four words with me? Who is your life? Such a powerful set of words right there. I'm trying to help you understand what does it mean when we say Christ who is your life? When do we use that kind of phraseology in our, in our vocabulary today? I'll give you a great example. When I was in college and I started dating my wife, right? When we started dating, before we were dating, I would go out with my friends a lot more. We would go to concerts and go out hiking and go to the dining hall together and we'd do all those things. And then when I started dating Melissa, people, my friends started noticing I wasn't hanging out with them so much anymore. Like every time they'd want to do something with me, I was off, you know, with my, with my girlfriend doing something else. And they would say something along the lines of, man, that girl has become your whole life. Yep. That's about, that's about right. She became my life. Like everything else in my life became less important because I wanted to spend time with her. She became my life, right? So when we say Christ, who is your life, you kind of understand what that means. You've probably used that phrase. Maybe you say things like, man, video games are my life, or baseball is my life, or the Ravens are my life. And so when we say things like that, we all understand what we're talking about. You're basically saying that this thing is so important to me that all the other things that are also important are less important to me because I've prioritized this thing. And what we, what we learn in this passage is that when you give your life to Christ, one of the ways we change the way we think is we recognize because Jesus is supreme and because Jesus is sufficient, that we're willing to say, Jesus, you are my life. Everything else, good or bad, is going to be less important than you. I want people around me to be like, man, you're just not the same anymore. Like, it seems like Jesus is your whole life. Yep, Jesus is my life. I think he's supreme and he's sufficient for all my joy, all my needs, everything. I, I, Jesus is my life. It's, it's, it's part of this process of changing the way we think. Now, I know what you might be thinking it's really easy to just say, change the way you think, but how do we do that practically? Let me, let me uh, pa talk through some other verses. These were also written by Paul, but not in his letter to the Colossians. He says in Philippians 4, verse 8, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So in, in Philippians 4, 8, Paul tells them you need to change the way you think. You need to start thinking about good things instead of evil things. You need to start thinking about excellent things instead of subpar things. You need to think about godly things instead of worldly things. Change the way you think. And I know what you're saying. It's still like, okay, that sounds great, but how do I practically do that? How do we change the way we think? So Paul writes in another letter to the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, he says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, okay? It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
Scripture says that you're supposed to take every thought in your new thinking process, you want to take it captive. Another way to think about this is like a sobriety checkpoint inside your head. So when thoughts come in, it's got to drive through the sobriety checkpoint, and you figure out right away, is this thing uh, uh, safe to keep moving along, or does it need to be crushed and taken to prison and, and, and whatever? Like, what, what, what's going on with these thoughts that are going on in my head? I need to take every thought captive. I need to pause it for a moment and learn, is this in line with goodness and truth and mercy and love and joy? Is this the way Jesus would think about this thing? And if it's not, eh, we cut it. We don't let it linger. We move on from it. And so there's this, this practical sense, but still, I'm, I'm still scratching my head thinking, well, how do I do that, though? How do I take a thought captive? I understand I'm supposed to be thinking about good things because I need to change the way I think, and so I need to take my thoughts, and I need to hold them captive for a minute and actually think through them. I'm going to give you a really practical thing. There's other things you can do, but let me give you one practical thing that all of us could do to start think, taking our thoughts captive. It's pretty simple. It's going to take some effort. And it's this, to memorize Scripture. I don't know what, what thoughts that are reoccurring in your head that aren't in line with truth. They aren't in line with righteousness. They aren't in line with goodness. You know the patterns of your mind, right? So you know that you, you maybe slip into lustful thoughts, or you slip into wanting to buy more stuff, or you slip into lies about your identity, or you slip into whatever. And whatever these thoughts are, what you can do, because we don't always just have a Bible ready to go at every thought that comes to our mind, is we can learn and memorize Scripture. And when one of those thoughts comes in, guys, before you take that second glance, you can process through Scripture in your head. Before you go and you buy that thing that you just have to have, you can process through memorized scripture, and you can remind yourself what's true. Before you pop off in anger, you can remind yourself that a fool gives full vent to their anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. And you can intentionally, right there, take that thought captive and attack it with scripture. But it doesn't work if you don't have anything memorized, if you don't know God's word and you're not committing it to your heart. And so that's a really practical thing you can do to th take thoughts captive. The very next verse in 2 Corinthians 10, we just read that verses, uh, verse 5, verse 6 says, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. And so we want to learn how to change the way we think, memorize scripture so that when we take a thought captive, we can attack the ones that aren't supposed to be there. All right, here's the second thing that we need to change. All right, if you believe that Jesus is sufficient and Jesus is supreme, then the second thing you want to do as a practical next step is you need to change the way you behave. I know we don't like that word, right? That's probably a word that's triggering for some of us. Behave, right? Like, what is that? Like, but practically, it's ultimately, if we change the way we think, you got to change the way you think first. Once we change the way we think, it's going to affect the way we obey. It's going to change the way we act. It's going to change the way we behave. And what, is, what does Paul say to the church in Corinth, or in, in Colossae, about behaving? Let's look at the next verse, verse 5, Colossians 3. It says, so put to death the sinful earthly things within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now it is time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. So in these, pass, uh, these verses of Colossians 3, you see a lot of active verbs, don't you? You see phrases like put to death, or have nothing to do with, or don't be, or get rid of, or don't lie. You see these things where you, as a believer, you have to change your behavior. 
You have to do the work. It's not going to happen accidentally. For a lot of us, maybe you were tricked into thinking that once you gave your life to Jesus and you got baptized, that everything was going to miraculously go away. Your sin struggles, your, your issues, your, your whatever it is, your addictions, that those things were just going to take care of themselves because, well, now you're a new creation and now your old self is dead and you've taken on this new flesh. So, uh, ta-da, I don't really have to do that much work anymore to get rid of my struggle with fill in the blank. If that's what you thought, you probably realized 30 minutes after getting home that Sunday that that's not the case. It's an active, constant uh, decision that we have to make to not only change the way we think, but then make a decision every day to keep our new flesh, our new clothes on, and not to put on the old clothes. To continue to make decisions that are honoring to, to God. I want you to think about this. On average... Every single one of us, we make 35,000 decisions per day. Some of those decisions are pretty major decisions, but most of them are like, should I eat another tater tot, right? <laughs> like, they're not major decisions. But if we can change the way we think and then let it affect the way we behave, we can make better decisions. We can change the way we think to change the way we behave. And it's going to take action on our part. It's not going to happen accidentally. I wrote down a few things here. Uh, your pornography addiction is not going to get rid of itself. You don't come up out of the waters of baptism and just be like, oh my goodness, I don't have any desire anymore to look at things on the internet. I'm not supposed to. It doesn't happen. You're going to have to change your, your thinking pattern so you can change your behavior. You're going to have some work to do. It's going to take work on your part. Your gambling problem is not going to go away without effort. Your anger issues will require careful attention. Your pride, your selfishness, your fill in the blank with whatever struggle you got going on, it's going to require work on your part. And it's work that's going to be practically impossible if you haven't first changed the way you think. See, I believe that Jesus is sufficient. I believe that he's supreme. In other words, I believe that he's over all things. He knows what's best for me. And he alone is my source of joy and my source of strength. He is sufficient and he's supreme. So therefore, I'm going to now change the way I think about this world. I'm going to change what I think about the thoughts coming into my head so that I can make decisions that honor God and are obedient to what he wants for my life. Got to change the way we behave. Really, do you want to find freedom from the things that are going on in your life that you just can't seem to overcome? You've got to change the way you think. You've got to take those thoughts captive, right? And then be actively involved, setting up the guardrails and the safety measures and all the things you need to do to get accountability to change the way you behave. You know what I find about verses like verses 5 through 9? It's really easy to read past these verses when you're reading the scriptures. It's really easy to read past them because we don't want to be uncomfortable with those words. We, we read past them really quick, or even worse, sometimes what we do is we read verses like 5 through 9, and we, we process them uh, with, with other people in consideration. Oh, man, the person sitting next to me struggles with these things. Or the person at work does all that stuff. And we don't ask ourselves the hard questions, how do we stack up when we take each of these words and turn them into a question? That's what I did for you to make you super uncomfortable. You ready? I'm going to ask some questions that take each of these words, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but when Paul's writing this list to the church in Colossae, he's simply saying, I want you to think through whether or not you're in obedience, you're behaving the way that God designed you to to, to exist in righteousness. So we see words like don't be this, don't do that, have nothing to do with. Let's look, look at those words. One is sexual immorality. Now there's a lot of ways I could ask this question. I don't have time to ask this question in a thousand different ways, but the one I wrote down is, hey, are you sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend? That's outside of God's plan for sexuality. You got to figure out how to knock that off and get in line with God's version of sexual morality, which is one man, one woman in marriage for life. 
How about this? Impurity and lust. Here's a really hard question. Do you delete your web history for a reason? Believer, do you have a, a struggle with what you view on the internet to the point where you know you're, you're ashamed of what you've seen, so you're going into that browser history and you're wiping it clean after you use the computer? Well, that would be an example where maybe you're struggling with impurity and lust. How about evil desires? Are you stepping on other people's backs to make much of yourself? Are you exploiting others? What about the word greed? Think about this one for a moment. Do you think that more stuff is the answer to meaning and purpose and joy in your life? Some of you, you, you don't even realize that you struggle with this, but every time you see something shiny on a commercial or you're on Amazon, you're like, oh, that looks cool, you just add to cart, add to cart, add to cart, and in some way, you're thinking, that will finally bring joy and fulfillment to my life. If I just had that, that's the last thing I need. And this kind of greed of just collecting stuff, thinking about, it, it, basically what you're saying is Jesus is not sufficient, Jesus is not supreme, but that ShamWow will do the trick. <laughs> what about anger and rage? Think about this honestly. Do you exhibit self-control? Or do you exhibit outside influence control? Do you let other people decide how you're going to respond? Or do you decide how you're going to respond in every situation? I said Proverbs 29, 11. This is a verse that in my house, our girls have to write this verse sometimes 10 times, sometimes 20 times, sometimes 100 times. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. How about the, the word malicious behavior? Think about malicious behavior. Do you find comfort or maybe even joy when others who are made in God's image experience difficulty or pain? Now you might think, what kind of sick person finds joy when other people go through difficulty or pain? But to be honest, all of us have been jealous of someone to the extent where our jealousy uh, rages so, so un, in an unhealthy way that when something bad happens to that person, we secretly are happy about it. Someone else made in the image of God that we have that kind of maliciousness how about slander? Do you like to share gossip? Do you like having the, like spilling the tea on other people? Saying things, exaggerating things, maybe, maybe they're true, maybe they're not, but you like to just slander other people with the way you talk about them? How about this one, dirty language? Here's a really simple question. Do you have a different vocabulary on Sunday mornings than you do on Mondays at work? The, the way you speak when you're around brothers and sisters in Christ, does that somehow change when you're like outside of the walls of the church? You're like, all right, well, I got a whole nother lingo we use in this world. Or could you be known to be a person whose life is Christ? And people see that simply by the words that you use. Another one that Paul covers, and the last one he covers in this list is lying. Hey, is your comfort more important than your character? Think about that for a moment. I'll give you an example of what this looks like. You've all been to probably an Asian buffet before, right? Where you go in there and you know there's a price break based on your age. If your kids are under 10, they don't pay very much to eat at the buffet. And if they're over 10, and, and I, I remember uh, multiple occasions where we would go out with family and our family, the ones who were going to pay the bill at the end, would look at my kids, you know, look at my 11-year-old and say, listen, when they come around, and they ask how old you are, you tell them, 10. <laughs> and I would look at my children, and I would say, no, when they come around and ask you how old you are, you're going to tell them how old you are. How old are you? 11. That's great. You say 11, and I will pay the difference because my character is not worth $4. Like, let's tell the truth. Let's not lie. Let's change the way we think so we can change the way we behave because our our character is more important than our comfort or four bucks of savings. So remember, in Scripture, it's talking about how we take 
off this old way of, of behaving. We take off this old way of thinking, which leads to this old way of behaving, and we're supposed to put on this new flesh, this new self. Another example of what it's like to put on the old flesh, probably one of the most uncomfortable things, I think I'll get a lot of people that agree with me, one of the most ick things, if you will, all right, is this, is when you have to put on a wet swimsuit. You know what that's like? It's like, oh, it's so uncomfortable. It's cold because you wore it yesterday, and yet you want to go back to the pool. So you put on that wet swimsuit. It's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to do it. Why do we go? I think I like the zombie illustration better. Why do we go and put on our old dead flesh and walk around with it? Why do we do that? That's the old way of thinking. That's the old way of behaving. Why do we go back and put that on? And, you know, why do we do that? And what do zombies shout out, right, when they're walking around? Flesh. Exactly. That's what we're after when we're in that old way of thinking, and we ought to change the way we think so we can change the way we behave, okay? Now let's look at this, this last one. Number three is change the way you align. Change the way you align. If you're not sure what that means yet, bear with me. I'll help you understand it. But let's look at the last two verses of our passage this morning, 10 and 11. It says, put on your new nature. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, uncircumcised or circumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. He's talking to a group of believers, and he says, listen, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're slave or free. Uh, Christ lives in each of us, and that's the thing that unites us, that we ought to align around. Last week, uh, my wife and I, we went to an Orioles game with some friends, and it was an interesting game because the Orioles were playing the San Francisco Giants. Now, somebody tell me out loud, what are the Orioles' two main colors, primary colors of an Orioles jersey? Orange and black. San Francisco Giants fans, what are their primary colors? Orange and black. So you're looking around the stadium, and you've got some Orioles fans, mostly Orioles fans, but you've got some Giants fans snuck in there too. And as far as you can tell, all Orioles fans showed up today because that's all the colors you're seeing. You're looking out at the field, and you're like, okay, wait, which team am I rooting for? I'm forgetting because they're all wearing practically the same colors. You got anyone in baby blue or bright red or nothing, right? It's like, who am I rooting for? That's one of the reasons we put on jerseys in a, in a sporting event, right? It's to help you recognize what team you're on so you're throwing the ball to the right people. You're, you know, you're playing the, the plays right to help your team and not to help the other team. But unfortunately for a lot of us, we, we are new creations in Christ and yet we somehow slip into our old jersey and we make more plays for the world than we do for Christ. We're out there influencing the kingdom of God, not for the better, but for the worse. We ought to align as brothers and sisters under the banner of, of Christ and saying we are all on the same team and we're gonna wear the same jersey. Have you guys, uh, you probably heard of a, a guy, if you, if you follow the NFL, named Wrong Way, uh, Wrong Way Jim. Have you heard of Wrong Way uh, Jim Marshall? Nobody? Anybody? Okay, well, let me tell you about Wrong Way Jim Marshall. Uh, Wrong Way Jim Marshall was part of a play. The ball was fumbled. He was on defense. The ball was fumbled. He recovers the ball and then runs towards the end zone super excited that nobody's chasing him. He gets into the end zone, spikes the ball in excitement until someone from his team came up and said, you ran the wrong way. You just scored points for the other team in the form of a safety and not for our team in the form of a touchdown. And, and Jim Marshall was actually a great football player. And his whole career was for, overshadowed by this one mistake to the place where he's now called wrong way Jim. For a lot of us, we put on a jersey at, at some point, and then we slip it off, and we put on the other team's jersey again, and we, we get confused as to which way we're aligning. And the truth is that as followers of Christ, we all have to be aligned. Listen, if you, it doesn't matter if you're from Baltimore 
or you're from the Dominican Republic, when you put on an Orioles jersey, you play for the Orioles. And when the Olympics come around and you're from the Dominican Republic and you put on a Dominican Republic jersey and you're from the U.S. and you put on a USA jersey, you play for those teams. Just play for the team of the jersey you're wearing. And what, what Paul is saying to the church in Colossae is let's change the way we align. Let's make sure we're all wearing the same jersey because this, this act of, of changing the way we think and changing the way we behave, it doesn't come naturally. It's a hard process. It's much better when you're doing it with a team behind you to help you. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't matter if you're slave or free. Let's put on the jersey of the banner of Christ and work on helping each other change the way we think and changing the way we behave. We need to change the way we align. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together. And I don't know if you're like me, but when I read this verse, I always read it like this in my head. This is how it sounds. Let us not neglect meeting together. <laughs> Some people do. I'm always like, I'm glad I'm not the some people. Let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Scripture says really clearly, not only are you supposed to put on your team jersey, but you're supposed to show up to the huddle. You're supposed to not neglect the meeting together. That's what we're doing right now. This is like the team huddle. This is where we get together and we look at the playbook together and we explore the different plays and then we walk out of here and what's the next step after a team huddle? You do the play. You run the play. Whatever the play is, like we're going to gather together, we're going to huddle, we're going to get uh, be challenged by God from his playbook and then we're going to walk out of these doors together and we're going to run the play. We're going to change the way we think. We're going to memorize scripture. We're going to change the way we behave. We're going to cut some things out of our life that aren't supposed to be there. We're going to make sure we're not putting on our old jersey, keeping our new one on. Not walking around like a zombie, but walking around someone who's a new creation in Christ. So what now? I want to ask everybody, listen, sometimes our what now God moment is very intentionally vague and that I want you to just allow the Holy Spirit to, to give you and prompt you with something unique. And that's always the case. We always want the Holy Spirit to communicate to you what you ought to do with this. But what I want everyone to do, I want us all to be aligned in this, is that on Sundays we take our note sheets and we flip them over. You see on the back side where it says, what now, God? And I want you to write down what it is that the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. In Habakkuk chapter 2, it says to write down the vision and make it plain. There's something powerful when you take what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do and you use your hand to write it down on a piece of paper. I want to encourage you to write down what the Holy Spirit is asking you to do today. We, we looked at the playbook. We huddled around the playbook. And now when we walk out of these doors, what are you going to do to run the play? And here's the one thing I want to challenge you if you're not sure what to do and you're like, hey, I don't know what the Holy Spirit's prompting me to do. Let me give you one, all right? Memorize scripture. If all of us this week could commit to memorizing one verse of scripture, find a passage that's going to be most useful in changing the way you think. What is it that you struggle with? Find the passage of scripture that, that rebuts that. What is it that you're, you're const a lie you're constantly believing? What's a passage of scripture that reminds you of truth? And pick that scripture and spend time this week memorizing it so that you're ready to start changing the way you think so you can start changing the way you behave as we align together. When I was in college, uh, there was a convocation speaker uh, at Liberty University. There's, there was probably about 10,000 students in this Vine Center at a convocation. And the speaker got up and he said, I want everyone to stand up. And so er that's what everyone did. We all stood up. And then he said, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stay standing if you have one verse of scripture memorized for every year you've been alive. He's talking to 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20, 21 year olds. So he's basically saying, hey, if you got about 20 verses of scripture memorized, stay standing. And he said, and by the way, if you're standing, I I'm gonna bring this mic over to you and, and make you prove it. 
and pretty much everyone, I remember I was in the room and I sat down real quick. I, I, I'm certain I had a handful of scriptures memorized, but I, I don't know if on the spot I could have spit out 18 of them in a row. But how sad is that, y'all? That for every year of our life, we couldn't dedicate to spending time to, to learn one passage of scripture that we can use actively to change the way we think so we can change our behavior. Each of us, we have the, 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 the ability to memorize a verse of scripture probably way more regularly than that. At least once a month, we could focus on a new passage of scripture. And so I wanna encourage you, maybe that's the thing you need to walk away with today is saying, I'm gonna be someone who, who spends time memorizing scripture so I can change the way I think and so I can change the way I behave. And so people see that I'm aligned with the team of Christ, under the banner of Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity you've given to us as a body of Christ to huddle together. I'm thankful for the playbook that you've given to us that we can open up and, and explore. We recognize that you want us to change the way we think, and you want us to align our actions in obedience with with who you've called us to be. You want us to change the way we behave. And you want us to recognize the power in helping each other accomplish that by aligning together under the same banner of Christ to, to move towards the great commission you've called us to. So would you help us to find a, a really simple and practical thing that we can do this week to take a step in that direction? We love you so much. We thank you for our time together and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.